All right, chapter 10, Mediterranean society, the Greek phase. This is when we get the beginnings of Western, well, not beginnings, the foundations of Western civilization. So here are the sequence of major civilizations of the Greek phase. The Minoan from 2200 to 1100 BCE, Mycenae, Mycenaean from 1600 to 1100 BCE, the Dark Ages from 1200 to 800 BCE, the Greek city cities from 800 to 350 BCE, the Macedonian Empire from 350 to 150 BCE. So the first major society we get is the Minoan society located on the island of Crete, with a major city in Knossos. It existed around two. Uh, around 220 existed around 22 began around 2200 BCE and it was a major center of maritime trade. It was influenced by Babylon by Babylon Egyptian Babylonian Egyptian and Phoenician society. Unsurprisingly, given this is not surprising given its location as a next at a, as a nexus of all these trade networks. Uh, they did develop a a script called Linear A, which was syllabary. However, scholars have been unable to decipher it. A series of natural disasters after 1100 BC, such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tidal waves, crippled Minoan society. The society was rebuilt, but then foreign invasions by Eastern Mediterranean pirates came along and destroyed the city and destroyed the society with foreign domination occurring by 1100 BCE. The Mahasinian society. Indo-European invaders descend through the Balkans into Peloponnesus, the so sovereign Greece, around 2200 BCE. They were influenced by Minoan culture when they got there, and they made a major settlement called Mycenae. But they uh, begin to militarily expand throughout the region, and the society existed from 1600 to 1100. Wait, 1600 to 1100 BCE. Well, if you, or that's when the military expansion was. So this is, you know, a map of the extension of Mycenae and Minoan society, you know, just occupying Pel Pel southern Greece, Peloponnesus, some islands, and Crete. The Trojan War occurs around from 1200 to BC, around 1200 BCE. This becomes the focus of Homer's The Iliad, with the sequel, The Odyssey. Uh, political turmoil and chaos continue from 1100 to 800 BCE, with the Dark Age of the dark ages coming on this is when this is when writing all of a sudden stops and we basically get a very long blank like a very long blank like empty blank in historical record the mycenaean civilization just simply disappears then you get the rise of the polis after the dark ages or the city states you know just like the Sum think of the sumerian city states they were ur they were urban centers dominating surrounding rural areas known as the hinterlands they had a high they were highly independent from each other most of them were oligarchies few monarchies and some early democracies so this is classical greece from 800 to 350 bce and I, as we can see this is where we saw where mycenaean society and minoan society were then we get and now we have this you know the famous city states from out Delphi, like you know, the Oracle of Delphi, Thebes, Athens, uh, Corinth, and Sparta. Sparta, as you might have, as you as popular media uh, has portrayed over and over again, was a highly militarized society. This was because of the nature of their economy, which was heavily dependent on subjugated peoples known as helots. They were serfs and tied to the land, and by sixth century BCE, they had outnumbered the Spartans ten to one. With this insane ratio, you need, the military society was developed to control the threat of rebellion. Reminds you of the American South, right? Spartan society emphasized austerity, you know. Live, live at the barest minimum. Only focus on bare necessities. Boys were moved from families at the age of seven and received military, military training, etc. in the barracks. So basically we're immediately, we're basically just drafting children into the military from the get-go. Yeah, that's that sounds such that sounds great, you know. Just imagine being taken just imagine being taken from a home and being forced into military life. Active military service would follow. You could marry, but but you couldn't live you couldn't live at home until age thirty. As a, due to this uh, major absence of men in public in uh, in day to day affairs day to day affairs because you know they were in the military, women were relatively out and about. 
there was some relaxation of discipline by 4th century BCE, 4th century CE, uh, like as you get the rise of aristocrats. Athens had experienced the development of early democracy. However, the only people who could vote were free adult males, or 10% of the population. Women and slaves were excluded. Uh, but it was still like considerably different, like uh, a considerably different style of government in, when compared to Spartan militarism. Think of the Soviet Union in the United States as an as a as a compare as an analogy. Maritime trade be, brings brings increasing prosperity beginning beginning around seventh century BCE. Aristocrats dominate smaller landowners, and surprisingly, you get increasing socioeconomic tensions and class conflict. Uh, so, obviously, you need to solve this problem, and a guy named Solomon mediates the crisis. The aristocrats get, get to keep the large land holdings, but all debts were forgiven, were forgiven and debt slavery is banned. Later reforms, by late, later reforms by successive people would open up offices to commoners and provide... And, um, and the and later and these offices would actually pay salaries, so you don't have to be just a you know so poverty won't be a major fa won't be something that bars you from public service. Per one of the ma most famous Athenian leaders was a guy named Pericles, who ruled from 461 to 429 BC. During his reign, this was the high point of Athenian democracy. He was an aristocrat, but extremely popular. He had mass he ordered massive public works projects that employed people. And he encouraged cultural development. Uh, due to the ex due to the expansion of population in Greek city states, uh, people start moving out and start colonizing their nearby areas. You know, just think about you know, as they say, demography is destiny. The these guys spread to the coastal Mediterranean and Black Sea, Sicily, Naples, or like you know, Naples. Uh, the name Naples comes from Neo Neapolis Neopol or New City. Southern France, Massalia, or Mars, now known as Marseille, Marseilles, I don't know. If, please, if you know how to pronounce this, please comment. Uh, and it, they also expand to Anatolian Aegean Islands, southern Ukraine. And they're basically like frogs around a pond. Now, this wasn't a central, like, now, don't think of this as, say, Spanish colonization where it was ordered by a king and, you know, go out and colonize his land. This is more just an example of, hey, I have a big, hey, we, we need to move out because it's getting a little crowded here. So this is a map demonstrating some of the early, some of these, uh, you know, Greek colonies. Sal you know, we get, we get at, one at Salamis. Uh, Phasis, Heraclea, Olbia, Byzantium, Neapolis, Messana, Syracuse, Serene, yada yada yada. Greek colonization increases trade throughout the region, communication of ideas, language, and culture, and also political and social effects. Now we get the Persian Wars, reign lasting from 500 to 479 BCE. The revolt. Ionian Greeks revolted against Ionian Greeks, which who are Greeks living in Anatolia, uh, revolted against Persian uh, Persian Empire um, around 500 BCE. Athens supports the rebellion of ships, but the rebellion is crushed by Darius in 493 BCE. Darius, however, is later routed at the Battle of Marathon by Greek hoplites or warriors in type formation in 490 BCE. Six, the, his successor, successor Xerxes, is able to burn down Athens, but driven out as well. It, some major uh, Greek victors like the Sea Battle of Salamis and Land Battle of Plataea. As a result of these devastating attacks, the city-states create the Delian League to forestall per more Persian attacks. It's led by Athens, and all the city-states had to pay money to Athens. And unfortunately, Pericles starts using this money that was supposed to be used for defense to fund his own public works projects. As you can imagine, the other cities are city states are super pissed off. You know, I mean, come on, you just contributed money to the cities to, for defense, and now this guy is using it to glorify his own city. Sounds kind of selfish, doesn't it? Now, and unfortunately, we also due to this uh, tension, Athens starts to become starts to become more and more tyrannical towards its neighbors. We get, a, for example, a, mo a moment, a, for example, we get something that occurs at, 
something an unpleasant occurrence at the Greek colony of Melos. Melos wanted to stay at, when when Athenian soldiers came upon Melos, they basically asked them, "Will you join us or join Sparta?" Which was, you know, this was during the Peloponnesian War. M- Melos said, "Let's stay neutral." The the Athenians responded very kindly by slaughtering all the male occupants and enslaving the female women and children. Yeah, democ- just democracy just starts to turn really nasty. A civil war, the Peloponnesian War, which was a civil war, racks like brings chaos to Greece from 431 to 404 BCE. Polys allied it with either Athens or Sparta. Athens is forced to surrender, but conflict continued between Sparta, Sparta and other Polys. Basically, these cities are so, so busy bickering amongst each other that they can't worry about foreign invasions. You know, so if you're a foreign invader, does this just looks this is too good to be true? These city, st- these powerful city states are just killing themselves in a civil war, so they'll be really easy to conquer, and eh, and they would be. So a little review will be the difference, the similarities and difference between Athens and Sparta. Uh, or differences actually, excuse me. Athens and democracy, they they were sea and trade based. They were more cosmopolitan. Sparta was a monarchy. It was military centered, and women had a bigger role. It was also more land based. Ma- now there's now now there is a um, kingdom. There's a there's a kingdom called Macedon to the north of Peloponnesus, but it but it does speak Greek. King Philip II, who reigns from 359 to 336 BCE, builds a giant military. And 350 BCE, he encroaches on Greek polis to the south, controlling the region by 338 BCE. Then we get his son, Alexander Macedon the Great. He's known or Alexander the Great. He basically goes on a military rampage throughout the Mediterranean basin, rapidly expanding his empire. He manages to successfully topple the Persian Empire, which is a which is significant concern. In fact, this was a very powerful society. He gets and he only gets turned back, and he, his invasion is only turned back in India when his exhausted troops mutinied. So this is a uh, map of Alexander's empire around 323 BCE. You know, as you can see, starting off from Macedonia, continuing to Anatolia. You know, well, let's take a little de- you know, let's do a little detour in Egypt, go to Syria, conquer the Persian Empire, continue on. Uh, you know, continue, you know, continue on, so not and whatnot. But of course, then his troops rebel, and they get they come back, and supposedly Alexander dies of a fever in Babylon. After Alexander's death, uh, there there's various ge- as various generals compete for um, parts of portions of the empire, eventually cutting it up. Antigonus got Greece and Macedon, but Ptolemy got Egypt. Seleucus and the Seleucus got the Persian Achaemenid Empire. But even despite this divided empire, you still get economic integration and intellectual cross fertilization. The Antigone Empire, all we're going to say about it for now is it was the smallest Hellenistic Empire. We got the Ptolemaic Empire. It was the wealthiest of the Hellenistic Empires. Its capital was in Alexandria. Guess who, guess who it was named after? It's an important port city and had a major museum and library. The Seleucid Empire, or basically what used to be the Persian Achaemenid Empire, was massively colonized by Greeks. Greek culture was exported here, and with its valleys stretching as far east as India. It, this can be seen in the Ke- Kingdom of Bactria, and in the fact that Ashoka, like the King uh, Emperor Ashoka's legis or edicts, were both in Greek and Aramaic. So this is basically just how the empire was divided. You know, Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic Kingdom being here, and Tigan and Kingdom being here, and the Seleucid Kingdom being here. So, with like when it comes to the Mediterranean basin, there was trade and integration. Since Greece, Greece had little grain bells rich in olives and and grapes. The colonies for trade and commerce, rather than agriculture, becomes basis of much of the economy. Now, in order now there were these festivals they were often organ that Greeks were organized, which were useful for integrating far flung colonies. Um, an example would be the Olympic Games, beginning around 776 BCE. This these festivals created a sense of collective identity. Patriarchy. This is what you find in almost every society. Women had limited exposure in public sphere. Veils were common. Now Sparta was a partial exception to this. Sappho. Shoot, I f- I think I forgot what that meant. Ah, oh, dang it. Okay. Oh wait. Actually, no. Oh wait. No, it's, exa- no, it's actually an example of what what next point about. Sorry about that. Ma- male homosexuality is okay, but not lesbianism. 
slavery was very common, and I mean, Greek societies like rely like you know in some like some places like they comprise a a third of the population. These include Scythians from Ukraine, Nubians from Africa, and sh- and uh, and these are basically forced into chattel slavery, and some was used in business. Now, in, in fact, the word. Funny enough, the word slavery comes from the word Slav because many of the these early slaves came from the came from came were Slavic people. Now they did have the opportunity to buy freedom. The Greeks borrowed the Phoenician alphabet around 800 BCE. They added and they added vowels, and so this allowed for a complex and flex, flexible language. As a result, you can get the spread of rational thought, reasoning, and philosophy. One of the major, first major, first mo, one of the most famous philosophers was Socrates, who lived from 470 to 399 BCE. He emphasized the Socratic method or critical thinking, which basically meant you question everything. You know, there's no absolutes. As he said, as he once famously said, the unexamined life is not worth living. His student was Plato, and unfortunate and unsurprisingly, due to his lo- lovely habit of questioning everything, he would um, he people the public would accuse him of of corrupting greek youth and as a result he was forced to kill himself plato who lived from 430 to 347 bce he systemized socratic thought and he had with his main fear being the theory of forms and ideas which said the real world is the is an imperfection of the world of ideas which is the, which is the which is basically an ideal world you know an example of this is the parable of the cave this would later influence Saint Augustine. Then you all, and you also get the Republic, a one of the mo, like a major political like political treatise treatise. It emphasized an elitist society led by philosopher kings as the ideal society. Arist- Plato's student was Aristotle, who lived from 389 to 322 BC. He broke with the forms, theory of forms and ideas, and he instead emphasizing on empirical finding senses reason. reason and reason, basically logic, basically logic, basically using, basically use, he said use logic and your using and your senses. He didn't really get catch into the scientific method, but he did, you know, create the foundations for it. This has a massive impact on Western thought, as you can imagine. It it influenced both Christians and Muslims. It was it was later it would be later embraced by scholastics around twelve twelve around the twelve hundreds in efforts to square reason and re- revelation. Greek theology emphasized personified animism, which basically meant that if it moves, it's it's a lot, it's a god. Polythe, you, know, you had polytheism for the common people, the Zeus is the principal god, and uh, and um, like an exa- and some of the and an example of the rituals you would find would be the bake or a Dion- Dion- Dionysian wild outdoor experimental goat sacrificing bender. It was just this crazy orgy-like festival. Eventually, these crazy rituals would be eventually would be des- domesticated. Tragic drama evol- evolves from public presentations of cultic rituals, with major playwrights ex- from re- existing around five fifth century BCE, such as Asychilus, C- As- Sophocles, Euripides, co- with comedy by Aristophanes. Hellenic philosophy all focused on personal tranquility and serenity in a cosmopolitan age. Uh, you had um, you had one of the major one of the three major philosophy free schools of thought were the Epicureans who focused on pleasure, which was distinct from hedonists, uh, skeptics who doubted possibility of certainty in everything, and Stoics who emphasized duty, virtue, and emphasis and inner peace. Philosophy appealed to the elites, but Mr. But Mr. Really just promoted eternal bliss for the masses. For example, the Egyptian cult of Osiris. As the, this is all famously explained by the uh, quote, by a quote, many mystery religions involve the worship of a savior whose death and resurrection will lead the way to eternal salvation for devoted followers. That's it. Thank you for listening.